By this point in time, I hope you've decided either to not play The Last of Us Part 2 for whatever reason, or you've completed the game and you're ready to talk about it. In my initial review of the game, which now seems like a lifetime ago, the reviewer's embargo restrictions were so stringent, I really don't think anyone could adequately speak to the issues and some of the triumphs of the game without talking about how the story is told. Unfortunately, the people at PlayStation didn't allow that. Not being able to talk about Joel, not even mention the name Abby, or use any of your own gameplay footage just didn't give a complete picture. And today I want to spend a little bit of time just chatting and maybe filling in that picture. See, there's a sequel. It wasn't as good. Ultimately, there is a lot that this game does right in terms of combat, the systems in place there, the world building around it, the character animations, the uh, character acting moments were really powerful. If you're coming to The Last of Us Part Two with an issue with lesbian stories being told, with trans characters having placement, with Abby clearly being transcoded or at least queer uh, gendered in, in some sort of way, Unfortunately, that's not really what I want to talk about here. I understand the concerns, but I think there are more legitimate concerns in regards to how the story is told that are quite persuasive to people that are looking at this game and calling it a masterpiece. Let's start talking about the death of Joel. For the hundreds of thousands of you out there that uh, got a chance to see the videos I produced on it, y'all are bit mad about that and I do understand why it's not unheard of for a game like this to have that happen in the inciting incident it is kind of interesting that we do have this at least transcoded woman literally beating to death someone that represented uh, perhaps more traditional masculinity in video games beforehand and then having us play that character is an interesting kind of twist of the knife for people. So if it, I do think there's maybe is a bit of a miscalculation there of the storyteller's ability to get us to empathize with the character of Abby. And I do think that how the story is told really stops that from being effective. But the death of Joel, a character you played in the first game that, that gave this entire series uh, a sense of pathos, is a way to tell a story. Having someone that you played before that means so much to the main character is a great way to inform Ellie's journey. But the fact that that death and the great moments they had was told in such a strange jumbled way, I think really highlights why Naughty Dog is not able to tell stories like they used to. So as soon as that happens, Ellie and Dina and then Jesse and then Tommy are all on this quest for vengeance. And that causes a certain pace, a certain momentum that stops the game from actually using the systems that are in place, which I kind of mentioned in the review a little bit. One of the moments in the game that I think does this really well is early on with Ellie and Dina, where they're traveling through downtown Seattle. You get to see little vignettes of uh, moments in history. It's very much Horizon Zero Dawn in that way. And you get to understand these characters in an interesting and compelling way. The worst thing about this game is that it doesn't seem to embrace the fact it's a game. And games give us something that other mediums can't, and that's reactivity. The stories that we create, even if they're crafted by someone else, are special to us because of the reactive choices. It's not just about us pressing a button on A, B, or C and making uh, a certain line of dialogue come up. It's about how we play the game and the choices we make therein. Because there was a sense of momentum after that one moment, I felt so often punished by trying to explore and experience these systems, by trying to get the collectibles, which ironically, if you do find, give you so much more of a backstory about the WLF, about Fedra, about the scars, and that is kind of the real 
underpinning here uh, that builds this world. So I hate games that hurt you for playing differently and don't at least incorporate that into the narrative. Because there is a momentum, the only moments that we got to see of levity were in flashbacks and the use of flashbacks, having them all muddled, having them in these kind of key act breaks, again, contextualizes a relationship between Ellie and Joel that we sort of already understood. And it's very much a, a film trope, but using it in games in this way, I think ultimately led to a dislike for Ellie because the character that we're playing now of Ellie is very different than the one we see in the flashbacks. The character that we play of Abby is very different than the one we see in the flashbacks. And that dissonance, that disconnect between what the cutscenes are showing us and what our actual experience of the characters is creates, I think, an inauthenticity. And I think that is what really rubs people the wrong way. If they can have no issue with the trans or lesbian identity, if they can understand that Joel wants, uh, could be killed in uh, the sake of storytelling, the thing that I think a lot of players can't take is when you feel like your choices and your actions are inauthentic. Nowhere does this happen more extremely than in the combat scenarios. The Last of Us Part Two wants you to feel bad for playing it, but I don't feel ownership for the choices I made because all of my gameplay choices don't reflect the Ellie that is in the cutscene. So basically, if you're playing this game and you're trying to explore, if you're playing this game and you're trying to uh, express combat in an interesting way, whether it is just through stealth or, or being ruthless in that way, the game makes a lot of effort to show you that killing these random enemies is intense. That burning dogs to death with a Molotov cocktail shouldn't make you feel good. And therefore, Ellie is a brooding character and you're playing a character that is sort of shade of gray. But that's something everyone already understood. That was established. This idea that the centralized theme of The Last of Us Part Two is what does true love mean? What does true hate mean? What are people willing to do to avenge a life is really undermined by Ellie ripping out the throats of hundreds of people as they scream and cry and name their friends and everything like that. It, it, it undercuts why she's going through all of this turmoil and getting worse and worse and worse why that matters, why, why that's something we we care about, because she's already killed hundreds, if not a thousand people in the worst ways you can imagine. So when you pose to the player the question of, is Ellie bad? You know, is she, what do, what do you think about Ellie doing these kills? We've already squared the circle. We've already understood that, okay, yeah, you want us to do this. You forced us to play in this way because there isn't a no kill option. You can't be pure stealth and avoid combat. So the game makers are forcing us to use this sort of violence and then asking us if that violence is bad and if that character is someone who is really a hero. And it's just the cheapest, most inauthentic way to create reactivity in a game. I think there's ways that games have been able to do that really, really well, like Spec Ops The Line. But what we're dealing with here is kind of the a faux interactivity. So the, there's so many moments in the game that you're seeing right now where they use quick time events and other interactive elements to allow us to have the, I guess, <laughs> lie of choice. That if you don't actually do the right thing during these very pivotal interactive cutscenes, it's not as if the story changes. So why give them to me as a player to begin with? I already feel like the Ellie I'm playing as is not the same one that's in the cutscenes. Why is Ellie, after the 2000th body that I've ripped apart, upset that in one instance she had to beat to death Nora? Why are we seeing her in all of the times she actually fights against the people that killed Joel having to fight in self-defense and not being active? 
actively brutal and murderous when in general gameplay, that is how she acts. So there's just, it doesn't make any sense for us to care about this character that mattered so much and had such clear intentions in the first game, when in the second, her motivations are skewed between the comprehensive combat system and the choices made there and the narrative system that wants us to feel like she's a shade of gray when we already know that she's a monster and that most of these characters are monsters. And speaking of monsters, I wanna take some time now to talk about Abby. The next time we see Abby after she brutally murders Joel is probably 10 to 12 hours of gameplay later. Ellie has already brutally killed everyone else that was in that room except for Abby. And now Abby is here killing a character we've come to love. After that moment, we don't play as Ellie again for at least 10 to 12 hours, despite the fact that now the story goes back in time to what Abby was doing for the past 10 to 12 hours that Ellie was playing at. And it's even separated by each day, Seattle day one, two, and three, just like Ellie's story was. There is no reason when you're trying to tell a story and clearly give some sense of authenticity and sympathy to a character like Abby, that you would have such a stark disconnect from these two characters. It doesn't make any sense from a storytelling perspective because Abby directly affects things in the world that Ellie is doing during those days, and so does Ellie. There's such a great distance of time between the two that caring about Abby now as a character is such an uphill battle and ultimately feels like you're being preached at by a narrative design team that really wants you to see shades of gray and everything. Yet still, Abby is a ruthless killer that is much more lethal in her combat style than Ellie is. It's a completely new way to see the game. And because she is so ruthless, her jump to becoming more humanistic for the audience is her relationship with Lev. And that relationship has to do with her role as a warrior. It has nothing to do with the story arc of Ellie and Joel. Her entire journey and why we're supposed to care about her has nothing to do with that inciting incident. So it's even more compelling to have this happen in conjunction with Ellie. Imagine if you had those moments where you got to play the first day as Ellie and now we're getting to know Abby a little bit more. I think it is much too of an ask to expect game players after spending that much time seeing her as the monstrous enemy and only being shown this reality to now accept that this character based on what we're seeing is one that we should empathize with and in the sense that you empathize with any of these characters because uh, let's be reminded that the last was part two wants you to know that everyone is bad and there are no heroes in this world and that's understood. We don't need to go through the most saccharine and forced scenes to experience that. That being said, that dissonance that I talked about before between gameplay and narrative is so striking here that I, I legitimately don't know how people who experience this game could get over it or, or feel like it's interesting because they work really hard to make Abby seem sympathetic, but she is even more brutal and, and ruthless in the way that she murders people that we know, based on context clues, are quite similar to her. And they just have an active war against. Yet you're expected to sympathize with her as a human caught up in these struggles because for once she's a little bit nice to the people that she has spent years killing leagues and leagues of. It, it, like even in comparison to Ellie's story, wherein I think they're trying to make Ellie seem more like the bad guy and make Abby seem more like the hero. 
it completely falls on its face because of the way that they allow us to play as these characters. And ultimately, it rings inauthentic because there is a complete lack of choice. This is a game that if we limited it in scope, I think could have been incredibly compelling if we changed a lot of the areas. We didn't need to have these ridiculously wide expanses and instead gave us the ability, either playing as Ellie or Abby, to make choices as these characters. Even the simple choice of the more you kill, the more deranged Ellie becomes. The more ruthlessly you kill, the more traumatized Ellie becomes, or vice versa for Abby. Giving us the ability not to kill, like they seem to indicate in a lot of these cutscenes, would allow that transition to a story of revenge and what you would do for revenge ring so much more authentically for these characters. I would care so more about what's happening to Ellie in these cutscenes if I had anything to do with the narrative moments that I saw. If you do decide not to interact in this way, you'll either die or your character will miss out on all of the vital backstory. If you don't clear out every enemy in a combat encounter, you miss out on the world building stuff that I think is genuinely done very, very well. So imagine if they just had, like I said before, scene by scene by scene, chapter by chapter, Ellie Abbey, having that interactivity, having these characters react to each other. And then when the final confrontation does happen, we as the player can make more of a choice of who these characters are, as opposed to feeling like the characters are one way in how we play them versus how they're shown on screen. Giving us that choice, I admittedly, it's a game that has its own faults, but Detroit Become Human does an excellent job of that. Imagine that game where you just played as one character for almost 15 hours, and then all the remaining chapters are the other characters. Having that level of interactivity in the world, making it our own, is I think one of the only ways that this game, up to this point of the theater scene, could have worked. After the theater scene, though, that final combat encounter. The ending after that, the third act of this game, is unique in how absolutely anodyne and pessimistic and just wrong-headed it is. It is, for me, one of the worst endings in any video game I've played in the last generation. Not because they choose to have a nihilistic, upsetting take on the protagonist, not because these characters ultimately realize that nothing matters and they've lost everything in their quest for vengeance. All of those are interesting themes that are explored in video games and other media a lot. It's deeply upsetting because it seems to be in such a service to one vision that doesn't benefit the player. Someone much smarter than me said, that there were two types of kind of auteur video game designers. Those that see video games as an important medium and try to push the limits of what it means to be in a game, but still retaining a game quality. Then there were others who are still completely considered geniuses in the field that seem to hate video games as a medium and want to work really hard to destroy it and turn it into something like uh, film or literature, where that lack of reactivity is what makes the story powerful. Video games work because they are reactive in the choices you make in dialogue, the choices you make in how you play, and the fact that you're playing this game. After the theater fight between Ellie and Abby, we are transported to literally a farm upstate, Ellie and Dina are raising the baby of Jesse, who is just killed by Avi. It is so implausible and out of the tone that we've seen so far that I legitimately believed 
that it was a dream sequence, that either Dina or Ellie that was left dying on the floor in the theater, those were kind of their final moments thinking of the life they wanted, but they lost because of this ongoing quest for vengeance. Whereas Abby, in that moment, was able to forgive as much as she could. Again, that it wasn't portrayed very well and wasn't gonna kill them. But instead, we get introduced to a completely new location, completely new enemies, and a clear directive of Abby and Lev as the new Ellie and Joel in their journey to find the Fireflies, ironically. Think of the efforts that were put in, the crunch hours that were made by the development team to create an entirely new location with entirely new enemies that are there for maybe two or three hours that contribute nothing to the story, just so that we can have one final protracted battle between Ellie and Dina, where Ellie is still racked with vengeance because she's a broken person because she saw her father, father brutally murdered in front of her and decides in the final moment to give a little bit of clemency to Abby as he's drowned. She's drowning her because he she is remembering, see these names, I gotta get these pronouns right, because Ellie is remembering the uh, kind of positive qualities of Joel and kind of looking at who she has become. And Abby just doesn't give a shit anymore. She's gone through hell, just wants to get out of there and live. She has Lev now, so she she's done with this story. Legitimately, a lot of people are asking, why now, in this moment, beyond just theatrical happenstance, would Ellie, after she has killed pregnant women, after she has brutally murdered in the gameplay thousands of people, in the cutscenes, people begging for their life, why now, when she legitimately has the person that committed this act, she would be unable to square that circle and kill something that she does constantly. That is how she interacts with the world. I understand what they're trying to do by showing that she doesn't in this moment, that she's already lost so much, but why now beyond kind of cinematic happenstance? It's cheap and deeply inauthentic for people that still at that point believed Ali had an interesting story arc and just to Again, we've all seen it, but just to put a capitalization on that, they have the most forced trope of the fingers being bitten off and now she can't play a goddamn song and look what she's lost, compounded by the loss of the one person she still had in her life, Dina, who's for some reason left that very secure place that, again, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when she killed, who knows, doesn't seem like it. But it, it's supposed to show, again, what Ellie has lost, and she leaves the guitar there because she has lost the memory of Joel. And I just, I think about the 30 hours, in my case, that preceded that moment, and the efforts that were put in by so many people to create a world that was interesting, a combat system that was brutal, but had that reactivity where things would move around you. Uh, moments in that game where characters were speaking that felt real, that felt authentic, and to have it punctuated by the one of the worst oversold metaphors of loss and a song of the soul of Joel, just reeks of people that are too smart by a half, that, that think that this, is, that this is depth when there's just pure nihilism. They don't realize that stories that are interesting like this need to be reactive to the player's choices, or at the very least, need to have an internal logic. And personally, I, I really believe that the, the entire third act after that theater scene shows a disrespect for the time that people have put in there and the people working on this game to build a whole new world just for that one protracted moment where she doesn't kill Abby. And if you're just, you know, foaming at the mouth for blood for Abby at that moment, I think you're missing the point too, because ultimately we leave The Last of Us looking at this game and realizing that none of it is worth it that these are all irredeemable characters, that they all will do whatever they can to 
achieve their means, whether or not it is love of people they care about or hate of people that have wronged them. The fact that Ellie has this brief moment where she realizes that she doesn't want to kill the one person that is directly responsible for all of her pain isn't depth. It's just inauspicious character design. And it's, I just, I, I really hate when a video game like this that's being hailed as a masterpiece doesn't take the time to consider player agency and it almost questions how connected we are to these characters that they're going to feel this way because I, as the developers made them feel this way. And that's not what games are. We give our time and our efforts to experience a story that we believe that we craft in a lot of ways, even if it's being told to us, but it needs to be authentic. And after that moment in particular, I felt nothing was authentic. Once again, ways that tomorrow they could make this game better have the Abbey chapters come in after the Ellie chapters. Have a little more of that reactivity where you see the changes in the world and you don't have such an uphill battle to make Abbey matter. And honestly, get rid of that entire third act. We don't need to know about the Rattlers and what's going down in Santa Fe. Have that theater scene, which we've all been building up to, be the final moment. Don't insult us with this idea they go to a fucking farm upstate. It reeks of inauthenticity. And I think that's why this is not finding the audience that a lot of people wish it did. For those that do think this is brilliant, I desperately want to understand why, because I think this game works really hard to make you not care about these characters with the ludo narrative dissonance, with the lack of internal logic, and with a game that's, I said in the review, really at war with itself, that punishes the player for using the systems they put in place, and then wants you as a player to feel bad that you did it. But I don't feel bad. I don't feel ownership of this because these characters aren't mine. You're loudly yelling at me that Ellie is bad. Look how bad she is. When we already knew that from the way we played, I don't think this is a game that achieves what people are saying. I think that people are perhaps being fooled with themes and tropes that are seen mostly in primetime television and, and movies and thinking that it means depth. When, when you really analyze it, this is a game about broken people not being able to function and not achieving their aims. And we're supposed to feel bad about that when we already understood that at the beginning. Not much more to say at this point. If you made it this far, salute to you. Hopefully, you were nodding your head as you heard this and not getting more and more fiery. But please, if you do believe that this story has depth and impact and important characterization, I want to know about it because for me, The Last of Us Part Two is the final game in a generation of storytellers that don't understand what video games can be. And we shouldn't see a game like this again going